This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey, listeners, whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews, news, whatever it is, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? Guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance, too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, and then they'll show you a variety of coverage that fits within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote and you'll be able to choose the best option for you fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. It was interesting when Rosie got back to me saying that you wanted to talk about it because the acknowledgement actually made me want to retract the question like, no, 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 that's hysterical. Mm. I mean, if we don't look at it directly, we can still ignore it and send our kids to school every day. Welcome to How To. I'm Amanda Ripley. It's kind of funny how often this happens. A listener will reach out to us with a really hard and important, vulnerable question. And then the morning after, they'll have second thoughts. They'll wonder, am I crazy? Is that question crazy? Is this just too hard to even talk about? Well, that's actually our specialty here at How To. Because what we found is, no matter how complicated and frustrating the problem, it doesn't get easier if we don't talk about it. So my name is Allison, and I live in Madison, Wisconsin. I have a ninth grader and a sixth grader in, oh, I'm all hot and sweaty. I don't know that that's relevant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you feel nervous just because we're doing Oh, it? my gosh. So, so nervous. Um, I don't usually, on a regular basis, speak to people. I work in a lab by myself. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, my kids are quiet. Uh -huh. There was this <laughs> pandemic that enhanced all of the quiet. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah. This is a really heavy subject, and uh, I don't think we should discount that. And I think it's kind of tempting to pretend this isn't happening. This is true. 50 million kids went to school last week. All but three of them came home. If we were talking about drug effectiveness, that would be worth the risk. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about our kids. Guns are now the leading cause of death for children in America, killing more kids than car accidents, which is utterly heartbreaking. And most of the time when kids are killed by guns, it's suicide or homicide outside of school. School shootings account for less than 1% of these tragedies. All of these shootings should be much more rare. And it's also true that the wall-to-wall -wall media coverage of school shootings in particular makes the fear visceral and impossible to ignore. Sandy Hook happened when my child my eldest was a kindergartner. He was in 4K. Mm. And there were kids that day who were the same age as my kid. And it's 10 years later. It hasn't abated. Mm. It's gotten worse. It's just too overwhelming. It's easy to slip into what ifs, especially when the one who's most worried about it is your own kid. The thing that really brought it to the head for me is that my kid doesn't feel safe and feels like a target. The kid in question is Allison's youngest, the sixth grader. They are a fantastic sibling. They're quiet and thoughtful and, God, they're just like the sun. I mean, they're just so bright. You can really hear the love and joy in your voice. When you say they're an excellent sibling, can you give us one example? <laughs> um... When they were quite young, um, I put my oldest child in a three-minute timeout mm -hmm. in their room. This kid went over and snuck snacks under the door <laughs> just in case those three minutes oh. were 
too long to survive and sat there by the door until this timeout was over. So, I mean, it's just, it's small, but that's how they treat everyone. Is that sweetness part of what you feel like you need to protect? Oh my God, yes. For a long time, this was a kid who refused to talk to other people. And so I was their voice. They hadn't spoken a word to their kindergarten teacher, their first grade teacher. You know, like I had been their voice for so long. And then in the back to school meeting with their teacher before school was third grade. I looked over and said, do you want me to talk for you? And they Mm -hmm. waved me off and they did the talking. When they bloomed, it was just sort of during the pandemic. And so I was the only one who got Mm -hmm. to see it, but it's pretty amazing. Since then, a lot has happened. Allison's child came out to their parents as non-binary and they returned to in-person classes at long last. But being back in school brought a wave of new fears with it. They came home one day and they'd been up stressed for a while and they had said something like, you know, I can't trust that the kids in my classroom aren't going to bring a gun to school. In Allison's initial email to us, she signed off with a question, which kind of captures everything. How do we live like this? She wrote. How do we work to prevent shootings and, meanwhile, send our kids to school? Send them to pick up their siblings? Heck, even to a parade? So today on the show, how do we live this way? There are things we can do, even if we can't do nearly enough. So let's get real and let's get strategic together. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey, listeners, whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews, news, whatever it is, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? Guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance, too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, and then they'll show you a variety of coverage that fits within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote, and you'll be able to choose the best option for you fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Macy's. Hey, y'all, what's up? It's your girl, Lene Vanee. I'm a writer, creator, and a change maker. And when you're a young adult, so much important change begins with access to higher education and resources. And that's why Macy supports APIA Scholars. It's a nonprofit devoted to the academic, personal, and professional success of Asian and Pacific Islander Americans. And it's on a mission to support young adults like Noor. My name is Noor Ali, and I am an APIA Scholar. The way that I grew up, I was a low-income first-generation college student. APA scholars played such a big part of my undergraduate career. The scholarship actually, like, gave a really good boost to my savings and just made me not worried about any unexpected costs, like my laptop breaking or me needing a new textbook. I've been able to get a mentor through the APA scholarship mentorship program who has been guiding me through graduate applications. My goal is to pursue a doctorate in clinical psychology with focus on, like, mental health for Asian Americans and other underserved communities. When you run up your Macy's purchase, you're not just supporting APIA scholars, but you're supporting the Asian American community. Now's the time to support APIA scholars like Noor. This May, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, when you round up your purchase at Macy's or donate online, you'll help fund access to leadership development programs, mental health support, and peer mentorships through APIA scholars. Give back and learn more at macy's.com slash purpose. Whenever there's yet another mass shooting in the headlines, I try to look to journalists who do more than just describe the devastation, who also offer context and history and even 
God forbid, possible solutions, which is where this week's expert comes in. My name is Melinda Wenner Moyer, and I've been a science journalist for 18 years. I have written a number of stories on the science of gun violence, and now I write a lot about parenting and the science of parenting. And as you can imagine, these two topics intersect a lot mm -hmm. now. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I should say, too, I have two kids of my own. I have an 11-year-old, almost 12-year-old boy and an 8-year-old girl. Melinda, I'm curious what you're thinking from what we've heard so far. Well, it resonates with me a lot. <laughs> I worry about my kids all the time. We have a lot of guns where I live. I live in Cold Spring, New York, which is about 60 miles north of the city. In my community, there's like a, a big political divide <laughs> where there's a lot of very liberal families and a lot of very conservative families and a lot of those more conservative families have guns. And so, you know, I think about it a lot. I wouldn't say, though, that that my kids feel the same degree of anxiety as Allison's. But I will say that just uh, Sunday, we were in the car driving to my son's soccer practice. My husband is a physics editor and, and cosmology editor, and he was talking about the fact that there's a big eclipse coming up next year and he wants the kids to see it. And he said, actually, one of the best places we might want to go to to see it is Texas. And my son was like, I don't I don't I don't want to go to Texas. I don't want to go to Texas. I don't want to get shot. I don't want to go to Texas. And I was like, whoa. Hmm. I mean, he'd never said anything hmm. like that before. And it was really like one of those moments where I was like, well, this is on his mind. <laughs> so I I struggle with it, too. And I think I tend to turn to statistics. Me too. I love statistics. So let's pause again for a little fact check. Texas does indeed have a decently high rate of gun deaths, but according to the CDC, 26 states are even higher. Still, I'm guessing none of that would make Melinda's kid feel any better, because that's not how fear works most of the time. As Allison discovered, there was no talking her kid out of their fears. As the school year went on, they started experiencing headaches, stomach aches, intrusive thoughts. They even started wearing certain clothes on certain days, hoping it would somehow prevent a shooting. We went to the pediatrician and then we went to um, a psychologist and he was helpful to a certain extent. He said, everyone has intrusive thoughts. As you get older, you just get better at processing them. He offered medicine if my kid thought it was too disruptive or talk therapy to sort of talk through these worrying scenarios. And I was mm -hmm. thinking, how do you do desensitization therapy to I'm worried a kid will bring a gun to school? I can't in good conscience say that's a real danger, but we can ignore it. Doesn't doesn't sit right. Yeah. Um it's really important for kids to feel safe, <laughs> even if like we aren't so sure they are. And so I'm constantly trying to think of ways to frame the issue, you know, where I'm not I'm not dishonest in any way. Um, I would never say this won't happen to you. You're at no risk. I could never say that. But think of ways. Can I be honest and also put it in some kind of perspective that will make them feel less terrified and me less terrified? And so. Yeah. And it's funny because as we're talking, I'm sitting here thinking about other risks, right? Um, so we know that the risk of getting in a car crash is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. And it's something I worry a lot about more than anyone in my family. <laughs> and so what do I do? Well, I talk about it too much. My son is his friends are now starting to drive. So I'm always like issuing these edicts and commandments and Whenever my husband leaves the house, I always say, drive safely as if that's going to help, right? As if it's like wearing a certain color. It'll somehow, <laughs> it'll somehow help. Um, but then this gun risk, I don't talk about as much, nearly as much, um, because it is somehow scarier. So I don't know. Do either of you think about other risks and how we talk about them? And is there anything to be learned, even though they're different? Yeah, yeah, I think about that a lot, actually. And I think about it, it's funny, specifically with regard to car crashes. I mean, when I think about how would I talk to my child about the risk of a car crash, I would talk about what do we do to try to mitigate that risk? What do we do to try to stay safe? Well, we wear our seatbelts and we drive the speed limit 
I think the scariest thing about all these is like they feel totally out of our control, right? Yeah, I think that is key, right? We need to feel like we have some sense of agency. And actually in the research on hope, some amount of control, even if it's small, is critical to having hope. Um, So part of the challenge here, right, is how do we convey that in a way that's honest and doesn't overstate how much agency we have? Allison, I wonder when you think about other risks, how do you talk to your kid about, I don't know, the risk of COVID or other other risks that you thought about or worried about? It's troublesome because my kids have always been compliant. Like they just, they liked rules, they followed rules. You know, other people don't feel as bound to certain rules. Mm -hmm. And so it does, in other ways, we keep trying to preach the idea that you can't control the actions of other people, but you can control yourself. Mm. And here, the danger just feels so overwhelming that Mm. Even if you are taking steps, those steps don't provide the same level of safety as you wearing a seatbelt. So when it comes to gun violence, what can we do? What does really matter for individuals is keeping guns out of the home. Like if a household has a gun, then that gun is 11 times more likely to be used in a suicide than in like self-defense. I mean, there's just... (sighs) You are doing a lot by not having guns in your home. And, you know, if uh, your kids are hanging out with other kids who have guns in their homes that, you know, ensuring that they're locked away with the ammunition locked separately, that's another really big thing. Once I interviewed a psychologist who studies um, gun violence and she said, you know, families with guns are more comfortable with having those kinds of conversations than Mm. you might think. Okay, here's our first two action items. One, try to keep guns out of your house. For some people, this can feel really counterintuitive, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. But the evidence is overwhelming. Having a gun at home makes your family less safe. Two, get used to talking about guns, actually asking other parents about guns in their home. If this sounds awkward, remember that a little vulnerability goes a long way. Allison, is there a world in which if you're talking to a parent, you could say, look, just between us, my kid has a lot of anxiety about guns and school shootings. So I always like to ask if you have guns in the house, just for peace of mind. Oh, that's a nice script. I like that. That's definitely doable. So those are conversations we can be having all the time. But How should we handle the spike in fear right after a high-profile shooting? Yeah, it's it's funny. When my son, I talked to him about um, the Uvalde massacre when it happened, because I I was worried, first of all, that he would hear about it from friends and maybe misunderstand things or, you know, not know what it meant or how scared to be. And so I actually brought it up with him um, right after it happened. And... He, you know, he brought up his school resource officer, the police officer in school. And I know that 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 the presence of these officers doesn't necessarily do anything helpful, but it for him, it was like, well, he keeps us safe. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to be less scared. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to burst that bubble. (laughs) I'm totally going to let him have that. (laughs) And I was like, you're right. Um, Sometimes, too, it can be for our kids about the perception of safety and without, you know, without lying to our kids. But. You know, I didn't feel like I had to correct him and say, well, actually, (laughs) let me tell you about, (laughs) Um, (laughs) you know, yeah, yeah. And so stuff like that, I think, can also help. Um, You know, I I kind of made a faux pas, though, in that time, too, because I said something about the lockdown drills he has. And I, um, I have done some research into them. And he was like, wait lockdown drills are for shooters <laughs> oh and I was like oh gosh <laughs> oh, and I, no. I actually since learned that a lot of kids don't know that that's why they have lockdown drills and I think that's actually a really good thing it like, is a good thing it's a really good thing when they don't know um and he was like oh I didn't know that's why we do it but okay if that keeps me safe too then that's great and you know I think at the end of that conversation he was he was feeling okay like I don't think that he is scared to go to school and I don't think that he should be you know, as Amanda said, like one in 10 million chance that is so slim. And so I just kind of remind myself of that over and over and over. And I'm like, I am more likely to get hit by lightning today than my child 
to be, you know, killed in a school shooting. And um, I think sometimes that just helps me feel better too in the moment. It might be the best analogy to, because that right now we don't know anyone who's been uh, hit by lightning. Mm -hmm. So it just takes a lot of repetition. Yeah. And it's not the only thing. I think you have to do a bunch of different things, right? I mean, there's a point at which no statistics are are just going to matter. That's just not how humans calculate risk. It's, It's emotional. Right. So we've been kind of dancing around how to give kids information about school shootings in an age-appropriate manner without unnecessarily freaking them out. So now I just want to run down some concrete guidance for all age groups. Obviously, really little kids may not know anything about these shootings. And if they do, offer simple information and help them name emotions. With older elementary kids, It makes sense to start by asking what they know and what questions they have. Respond in a calm manner and don't overshare. Be sure to talk about safety measures everyone's taking, including them. For tweens and teens, they're going to encounter a ton of information on their own, whether we like it or not. Still, start with questions. Listen and remind them that they can help prevent shootings by listening to other kids and talking to a wise adult if they hear a kid is suicidal or threatening to be violent. Now, we're gonna take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to hear what big changes can be made realistically and systemically that could help. Stay with us. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the credit card created by Apple. Apple Card gives you unlimited daily cash back up to 3%. Now you can choose to automatically send that daily cash to a high-yield savings account where it'll grow on its own. And savings is built right into the Wallet app, so it's easy to monitor your progress. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone with no impact to your credit score and start growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Accepting an Apple Card after your application is approved will result in a hard inquiry, which may impact your credit score. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts are provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, member FDIC. Terms apply. There's no doubt about it. College is stressful for both kids and their parents, especially when it comes to figuring out how to pay for it. Good thing there's now a resource to help college-bound families breathe easy. It's called College Ave Student Loans. College Ave is here to help you take the stress out of paying for college with loans designed to fit your unique budget and goals. Through a simple three-minute application, flexible repayment options, and helpful tools, this is your shortcut on the road to college. To learn more, visit collegeav.com slash howto and enter to win their $1,000 college scholarship. There's no purchase necessary to enter or win the scholarship. See official contest rules for details at collegeav.com slash how to. About five years ago, tired of feeling badly because I wasn't meditating, I finally downloaded the Headspace app and I started meditating just 10 minutes a day. It kind of blew my mind because it was actually much more educational and inspiring and I feel much better off for it. One thing I've learned about meditation is, you know, you don't want to do it on your own. It's helpful to have some guidance. Headspace has helped more than 100 million people worldwide, and they can help you too. Listen up, you do not want to miss this. For a limited time, all of you can try Headspace free for 30 days by going to headspace.com slash howto30. You won't find this offer anywhere else. Use the link headspace.com slash howto30 to unlock all of Headspace free for 30 days. This is not something they normally do. Headspace.com slash howto30. One of the solutions we hear over and over is that we don't need fewer guns. We actually need more. Or as Wayne LaPierre, the head of the National Rifle Association, put it, The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. So five years ago, Melinda set out on a road trip to figure out 
Does more guns in more places actually reduce crime? I wanted to answer that question specifically with science. And as part of that, too, I went on this road trip through the South. There's a city in Georgia where they actually mandate that everyone own a gun, Kennesaw, Georgia. And I went to a town in um, Alabama where I think one in five people have a, a concealed carry permit is like the highest rate in the country. Anyway, I talked to a lot of gun owners there and a lot of very, you know, super pro gun people like they were like, the NRA has lost the plot. I do not agree with what they say. They have gone so far right. We need to be more careful with guns. Like it used to be too that the NRA supported certain gun laws and they've I mean they've just gone off the rails and I think we have to remember that like most gun owners actually support a lot of these laws. It's just mm-hmm. the NRA is, you know, telling everybody that that's not true. So as part of the piece I went to a gun range and I shot a Glock 19, which I honestly had no real desire to ever do. But I was like, I I think I need to experience this. As soon as I shot the target, I felt so invincible. And I was like, oh, my God, like this is how people feel when they own and shoot guns. They feel like they can protect themselves. They can protect their family. Nobody can get them. And of course, this is a fallacy. and, And when we own guns, we're just more likely to, you know, make mistakes with them and cause accidents. Mm -hmm. But I really, in that moment, just, I was like, I I kind of get it. Did you emerge from doing that reporting more or less hopeful about what we might see in our lifetimes when it comes to gun safety changes? Mm. It's a really good question. It was a little, (laughs) a little bit of both, to be honest. Yeah. I think I did find it Uh, reassuring to know that a lot of the gun owners that I spoke with, they were actually somewhat thoughtful about guns and about their risks. That gave me hope. On the other hand, it became clear that they had no real interest in data either. Like there were people I spoke to who said, you don't need to know what the numbers say, because of course, if you own a gun, you're going to be safer. Like nobody's going to come to your house if you have a gun at your house and nobody. And they just had this like this idea of how it should work Mm -hmm. that was so impermeable to data and logic and actual information. Right, right. Like you want to believe that there must be a way, there must be a way to convince you. Um, And that's, you know, I will say though, yeah, the um, detective, that I met with in Kennesaw, who was, when I met him, he was like, I am so pro gun. You know, you could just tell he was very pro gun. He was very proud of the law there. And he, when I, when the piece came out, he was so thoughtful. He shared it. I mean, and my conclusion Mm -hmm. was, you know, Kennesaw's gun laws haven't actually done anything great. And um, among other things. And Mm -hmm. he was like, you know, this really made me think, thank you for writing it. And I was like, Wow. So that, you know, that gives me some hope. That is so interesting because as you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, a lot of what I do in my writing is focus on how people change their minds, especially in intractable conflict, which would include guns in the United States, obviously. And the thing you keep coming back to in all the research is relationship. Relationships are how people shift. And it's frustrating because you can't have a relationship with everyone all at once, right? It's hard to do. And that sounds like one of those examples. I'm not saying he changed his mind or you changed your mind, right? But there's there was some kind of opening there, and it had to do with maybe, I don't know, but maybe he felt like you listened to him. Yeah, maybe. This is actually an interesting thread that came up again and again in this conversation. We have got to talk to each other about hard things. We have to start with people we don't agree with, and we have to talk to our own kids. It's the exact opposite of what we want to do, but the research shows that we have to do it anyway. Yeah, I'm kind of laughing over here because this is such a big theme of my book, actually. Melinda's book is called How to Raise Kids Who Aren't Assholes, one of the best titles of all time. For my book, I I researched a bunch of different like seemingly disparate 
topics um, like how do we prevent our kids from becoming racist? How do we prevent our kids from becoming sexist? Uh, All these issues. And basically, like the one thing that kept coming up over and over again, as I interviewed researchers in these very different areas um, was, you know, parents don't like to talk about this, but talking to kids about this is the best thing Hmm. that you can do to keep your kids safe and healthy. And so that's true of talking to kids about gun violence. I mean, it just comes up over and over again. And it's always these topics that we we think the opposite. Mm -hmm. We think if I talk to my kids about this, it's going to either scare them or it's going to make them biased. The same, I think, can be true for things like guns, where if we don't talk to our kids about it, they might create this sort of... um, you know, really inaccurate um, picture of what risk Mm. looks like and what they can do to stay safe. And so talking to our kids and really, you know, framing the issue according to our values and according to what the data really show can really help our kids um, understand things in a, in a way that keeps them both safer and, you know, healthier and um, maybe less anxious as well. You know, anytime I'm talking to my kids about something terrible in the world, I almost always end it with, what can we do to make mm-hmm. this better? Like, what do you think we should do mm-hmm. right now? And I, those are the best parts of this conversations because my kids will say, like, can we go to a protest? Can we look up where we could give money to support a cause? You know, can we make signs to put in our yard? You know, even little things like that. But mm-hmm. they can be agents of change. Like it doesn't always have to be this way. And I know with gun violence, it feels like nothing ever changes. And it it is really, really frustrating. But things are changing a little bit. They are improving in some ways. And like the more we can just remember, like there are little things that we can do and there are little things we can do and and do with our kids. Um, I think that's Hmm. also, you know, empowering. Yeah, it's so funny how as we're talking, I'm thinking about how we need to do the things that the news does not do enough or sometimes at all like put things in perspective, bring it back to what we can do, mm-hmm. however insufficient, right? What works to reduce gun violence? You know, that old saying, you need to give your fear a job or else it'll get you one way or another, you know? So I wonder, Allison, have you, is there any kind of activism or advocacy that you've considered or, or kind of looked into? You're, you're right there in the Capitol, right? So, you know, there's undoubtedly yes. <laughs> activities yeah. that are... There's a lot of marches that you can participate in, and it, it is it is a good feeling when you do that. Although I have to admit that, like, uh-huh. I'm also a letter writer, but, I mean, you can only write yeah. so many letters. Like, I don't want it to be performative. So when I'm telling the kids, like, we should pay attention to this, and I want you to see the good behind this, I I have to believe it first and be totally vested in it, which is maybe the thing where I don't have a 100% invested Mm -hmm. belief that they're going to be safe. I think that's what it comes down to. It's like, I don't want to lie to you. I want want you to accept that there is a risk, but that we still accept it as a nominal risk that we can live with and perhaps change. I just don't know how. I feel like most of my advocacy is honestly through my writing and through trying to educate parents and other people. And that's kind of like how I do it. And that maybe isn't a way that some people would think of as like uh, activism. But I just think they're, I don't know, teaching people not to be assholes seems like a pretty good start. <laughs> okay, um, well, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> okay. I just I, I feel like sometimes I talk to parents who are like, I don't have time to go to marches, or I, I don't feel comfortable at protests because of like, maybe they're nervous of um, something, you know, violent happening. And And I just don't want people to think that like, that means that they're failing in some way or that they aren't being a good activist. Like there's just so many, so many ways to make a difference. And I think you, you know, I can tell just talking to you that there are a lot of ways in which you are, (laughs) you know, you're educating your kids, you're, I'm sure that you are, as you said, you write letters, you vote, like there are a lot of things that you're doing to address this issue. To not raise assholes. And that's the other thing. I mean, Uh, that's the goal. Well, that's like the premise is that if we can, 
if we can raise kids who are going to be activists themselves and who are going to be empathetic, like we are changing the world as parents through our children. Like parenting is a form of activism. That's kind of my whole, sorry, I'll, I'll, <laughs> thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> We always struggle with the tension between doing things on an individual or family level and and making bigger changes, right, that need to happen. And we need to talk about both. And I wonder, Melinda, in your reporting, have you gotten a sense of which bigger legislative or structural changes seem to actually matter when it comes to gun violence? Yes. I, I Sometimes I feel like I write about things that give me a sense of hope. I'm like, For sure. let me yes. <laughs> see if I can find, you know, five laws that mm-hmm. actually would prevent mass shootings or what are the key laws for keeping kids safe? And yeah, so um, I have and there's there's a there's a handful um, that really, you know, the research is starting to suggest really can make a big difference and that do exist in some states. So, I mean, one problem with background checks and we do need them, uh, I'm not suggesting we eliminate them, but is that, you know, buyers, when they're buying from private sellers, they don't undergo background checks. It's this very big loophole. Um, also, background checks don't always work. They don't, you know, some sometimes there's not the right information in the databases. Um, but a lot of researchers who study gun violence are, are very much in support of these permit to purchase laws where before you purchase a gun, you basically have to apply for a permit or a license. And it takes 30 days. And then there's like a very stringent, you know, check that's done. Um, and we know that states that have those have, you know, fewer mass shootings. Right now, people with domestic violence convictions are banned from buying guns, you know, if they are caught in background checks. But I think we know that we should have restrictions, more restrictions for people who are convicted of any violent crime. And a lot of those <laughs> just nobody goes and takes their guns like they have to like volunteer to give up their guns or or they don't get confiscated. And so we could change laws to crack down on that and to, you know, have guns taken away from people who have domestic violence convictions. That's another big one. Um, the red flag laws that people talk about where we can, you know, kind of issue a special brief protection order that allows police to confiscate guns from people who have made threats or who, you know, seem suicidal or, or violent in some way. Um, 19 states, I think at least plus Washington, D.C. have those now. So mm-hmm. I'm so glad, Melinda, that you brought up red flag or extreme risk laws, because this is one thing, I mean, there there needs to be more research. But from what we know, it does seem like this is something that really does work. And one of the challenges is that a lot of people don't know that these laws exist, right? And also, Allison, Wisconsin does not have uh, red flag laws or extreme risk laws, according to my research, at least. And yet 80% of your fellow Wisconsinites support this kind of legislation. Um, And it is one of the few things where there is support across political difference. So Republicans and Democrats tend to support red flag laws because it just makes common sense, right? But I don't know, Allison, is that something that you could imagine digging into in your state? Yes, absolutely. It's funny because I... um... And the next thing I was thinking, like, oh, we really got to get some more mental health experts in our high schools. <laughs> yeah, that would be that's another. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, <laughs> that would be another way to to come at this, right? Is like, how can we do that? And don't do it alone, right? I mean, I think there's a lot of strength in community around this. So I took my son to the March for Our Lives protest here in Washington after Parkland, and. You know, you just you look around and you see just thousands and thousands and thousands of people, most of them kids, by the way, just chanting and singing and laughing. And you just can't help but be be moved by it. And to remember that we're all out here. Most Americans agree on this. And so we cannot let ourselves be silenced by hopelessness. It's hard to talk about, but it's it's so important. The more we revisit it and talk about it, I think the better. Thank you, Allison, for not retracting your question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad that you were able to, you know, pull out threads and, and make some more concrete sense about it. What about the rest of you? 
What are you trying to do or not do in order to feel or actually be a little bit safer in your own communities? What kind of activism do you feel most hopeful about? What other questions do you have that we can help you answer? Send us a note at howto at slate.com or leave us a voicemail at 646-495-4001. That's also, of course, where you can ask us any other question that you later wish you could retract. (laughs) If you want to read more of Melinda's work, check out her book, How to Raise Kids Who Aren't Assholes. And if you like what you heard today, please give us a rating and a review and tell a friend. That helps us help more people. How To's executive producer is Derek John. Rosemary Belson, Kevin Bendis, and Jabari Butler produced this episode. Merritt Jacob is senior technical director. Charles Duhigg created the show. Carvel Wallace is my co-host. I'm Amanda Ripley. Thanks for listening. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids, and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now.